world. <laughs> okay, hello. Well, we are beginning the, our session nine of the AFI, Association for Evolutionary Economics. And we have five uh, papers here, very interesting, but and we are going to begin with Robert Scott, who has written a paper with Steve Pressman. Robert, you, are, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Alicia. Let me uh, share my screen here. Hopefully everyone will see it shortly. Everybody seeing this? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, so go ahead and get started. Everyone can see this in full, full Zoom, we're good. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Robert Scott. Um, I am at Monmouth University in New Jersey. Um, and uh, I wrote this paper with uh, Steve Pressman who uh, was also at Monmouth uh, with me uh, for many years and now is at uh, Colorado State University. Um, Steve couldn't be here uh, with us uh, today because he's uh, doing some physical therapy. He uh, had a, a minor uh, heart surgery. They always say the only surgery uh, that's minor is uh, surgery done on somebody else, I guess. So, um, but, it's, uh, but he's doing very well and he's recovering and uh, very nicely. He had the, the surgery before Thanksgiving. So, um, so he's He's getting on well. Um, anyway, so uh, so I told him I would uh, take over responsibility, um, especially since it's not in Chicago, uh, and, and present our paper. So we changed the title a little bit. Um, we initially focused the paper on uh, several different aspects of uh, institutional failures to, uh, dealing with COVID-19, um, but it was it ended up being a little uh, a little too over ambitious, um, and so we had to scale it back a bit. It started getting a, a little long. Um, so. So anyway, um, so we ended up ultimately focusing on sort of two factors. And uh, the reason for this, is because as, as most of us know, um, I, I always say that this has been a really great time to be an economist and a terrible time to be most everybody else, um, because it really has been fascinating, um, you know, teaching classes with students and discussing the implications, particularly in the spring. You know, students were sort of saying, you know, gee, you know, the economy shut down, you know, not just here, but globally, you know, what are the impacts of that? And I told him, well, remember we talked about the paradox of thrift, right? Um, years, you know, uh, early on in the semester, I said this is like a paradox of thrift, you know, on a global scale. Um, and so, so you know, so we started going through the implications of this. And and so Steve and I were talking about this um, in the spring, and we were sort of saying, well, you know, what are the what are really the the important components um, when we're dealing with a, a pandemic, and especially a different type of recession. Um, than what we've seen in the past, right? This sort of supply side, you know, recession where it's not a lack of demand, right? It's a lack of an ability to go anywhere. And so we, we honed in on two different pieces. Um, one is, you know, sort of the two big themes, um, which is unemployment, of course, um, because that's gonna right, drive um, all the economic change that we're gonna see, most of it, a lot of it. And the second piece is obviously healthcare. Um, and we focus this mostly on the, in the United States, um, but we pulled um, historical pieces in the paper. We pulled things from, uh, you know, globally um, from all over the world, but most of the implications are, are for the United States economy. So, um, so naturally, we all know that with, you know, COVID-19, we saw a reduction in, um, you know, in jobs and we've seen a tremendous amount of job loss. And well, not just in the United States, of course, but across the globe. And, um, you know, how that sort of filtered down and then, of course, how each country has responded uh, to that, right, to that slowdown that we've experienced. So um, some places like the UK have sort of, you know, uh, given, a, you know, 60 percent, um, you know, pay back to employees with, you know, businesses paying 20 percent in the United States. You know, they sort of ramped up the unemployment insurance, which they just renewed, though not quite as generous as the one that was passed um, in March. Um, to sort of deal with some of the, uh, you know, the, the lack of, of jobs and the insufficient incomes um, needed to, to keep the economy afloat. So we sort of talk about some best practices. Um, we also go into some of the history of um, unemployment insurance and why it's, uh, you know, why it's important, sort of how it, it came about, and that it's a fairly new phenomenon that really started, you know, with William Beveridge, uh, which most of us know, you know, worked with, um, you know, worked with Keynes to a certain degree um, in building sort of the welfare state. Um, if any of you read uh, Zachary Carter's book, you know, it's really interesting, you know, on Keynes where it talks about uh, beverage developing uh, the welfare state with Keynes. And the part of it was, 
you know, uh, having these types of social safety nets um, in place um, for society and, and how important it is. Um, certainly when we have, you know, a situation as we're seeing now, um, those social safety nets are tested um, and we can sort of see how strong they are, how resilient they are, um, and, and how successful they are at sort of accomplishing the goal, right? Which is, you know, securing employment and, and more important, I mean, the employment's important and, and that'll really come later. Um, that's something that we don't really have good data on right now, um, but we still, you know, it will be important later to make sure the jobs are restored. But at least for now, um, we need to make sure that, that people have the income, sufficient incomes in order to, you know, meet the, the food demands and the, you know, the, all the other demands that they, they need to live. Uh, you know, the social provisioning, right, um, to live in, in modern society. So anyway, and then, so, so that's the unemployment piece of it, which I'll go into. And the second piece of it is obviously um, healthcare. Um, you know, these are tied up deeply in, um, in institutional economics. And in fact, it was interesting. I, I didn't realize um, before uh, we, we were doing this paper, I didn't realize how strong of a connection there was between institutional economics, which is surprising since, you know, that's you know, my, my big thing, you know, I, but I didn't know how much of a connection there was with healthcare and the, the early institutional economists um, like Richard T. Eli and uh, John R. Commons and, and some of the others. I didn't, I, you know, so I started digging into that and really was uh, pretty fascinating. In fact, that's just a, that's a whole paper in and of itself, um, maybe more than a paper. Um, so, uh, so a really interesting area that I, I really knew nothing about. I'm a consumer credit and debt person. So that's, you know, that's where I was coming from. So I know I'm not really sort of the healthcare person. Um, so maybe some of you who are more focused on the healthcare piece, um, would, uh, sort of know that, that history better than myself, but, um, but I didn't know. So anyway, so we pull some of that information into the paper. So, um, so again, where, where did, I'll start with unemployment insurance, then I'll switch to healthcare and then talk about some policy prescriptions. So unemployment insurance uh, started, you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, as I said, uh, beverage and some of these others. And it was really seen as a way to give protection um, for, for employees, um, but it also ended up being a benefit for some of the businesses um, who were sort of, you know, again, if you're producing goods and, you know, you lay everybody off, then nobody's going to be able to buy your goods and services, right? So it became a, an actually town's and, and, and larger cities that had strong unemployment insurance um, and social protections were, um, were more competitive. Um, you know, it gave them uh, their competitive advantage to, to um, you know, to maintain this uh, income level um, and spending and consumption, which obviously is uh, key to keeping the economy spinning. Um, so, so what we saw, um, you know, see today and, and some of the, the problems that we experience with unemployment insurance, particularly again with the United States, but, but this is true in other countries. Um, and that is that uh, a lot of, you know, the, the part-time workers, um, the, the people who are working um, in sort of the, uh, you know, the, the dark sectors of the economy, right, that aren't, um, you know, well uh, established, um, you know, within the, the formal institutions, um, and, uh, you know, the, the people work in the, the, in the gig economy and, and, and all those folks who aren't in the, again, sort of formal institutional employment market can, can be locked out of, of unemployment insurance and not be able to, uh, to contribute. Um, and, and this is certainly the case in, in other countries. Um, it's true in the United States, but it's also true in lots of other countries um, that, that a number of employees um, who lose their jobs because of a downturn in the economy, particularly something like what we're experiencing now, um, they, are, they really have limited opportunities, um, and, or limited opportunities to be able to participate in the, you know, the social uh, safety net um, that's created. Um, uh, you know, we know that uh, a little over a third of people, um, you know, who were unemployed during the Great Recession, 08, 09, um, and, and continued into 2010, that was, you know, debatably over, you know, somewhat by then, um, but uh, received, um, you know, uh, you, um, uh, you know, unemployment benefits. Um, really, I mean, it's not even, not even half, I mean, it's a little over a third of people were, were unable to receive sort of the full benefits, I should say, you know, I mean, they've received some other smaller benefits, but not, not really the full, um, or even close to full, I should say, um, uh, unemployment benefits that they um, would have been entitled to had they been in the formal sector of employment. And we see this across, um, across the globe, 
when we look at you know the contribution levels. Now, again, as I said, UK and some other places have been more more generous and more uh, creative, which is interesting, right? I mean, given the state of the the political system there, uh, but they actually um, have uh, came up with some sort of creative, uh, very Keynesian. Um, you know, models to be able to replace income um, to get over this. Now, how long that lasts, um, you know, obviously it's, it's going to depend. We don't really know. Um, we sort of, we kept, you know, we keep getting more and more data. So we're, we're trying to hit a moving target here. Um, but that's sort of the, the setup, right? So anyway, um, I talked about this already a little bit, right? The big problems here, unemployment benefits, you know, extending. Uh, obviously, they just passed the extension uh, for the unemployment benefits to be able to continue. As I said before, a little less generous. It was unemployment insurance plus um, uh, plus $600, right? Um, per week, it's now down to $300 per week. So it's half of that, um, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly better and um, it certainly helps a lot of people. But, you know, um, when this runs out, you know, it will depend on whether that coincides with, you know, an uptick in the economy, obviously. Um, so, uh, so we, again, that's, you know, that's fa fairly well understood, I think, well established. Um, you know, I, I think, again, we'll see in another six months sort of where the job situation is for the unemployment benefits, you know, I mean, it, the key is sort of where does employment fall once all this starts to, you know, um, hopefully ease. Um, Healthcare is the, the next biggest piece um, that people are sort of dealing with. And this is, um, this is a much more complicated problem um, because it, it's so large. And of course, you know, each country deals with it differently. In the United States, um, obviously we lack um, any kind of universal coverage um, for healthcare. And uh, you know, the, one of the misunderstandings um, that I, I was reading through in the literature pretty heavily is that there's a lot of misunderstandings to what universal healthcare means. You know, they talk about today, they say Medicare for all, but it's not really well defined. I mean, I read, read all the documents on Medicare for all. Everybody has this very different vision of what that is and what it represents. And each country has, uh, has really very different um, viewpoints, some of them being, you know, much more sort of market oriented, others much more uh, centralized, um, you know, at the, at the government level. Um, but, you know, most of them have some kind of cost sharing system. Most of them, um, even the most generous, um, you know, universal health coverages, again, there's, there's cost sharing, they still have, you know, private insurance still exists. Um, you know, there's still, still a market for certain things. The difference is, is that insurance acts the way insurance should act. Right, um, healthcare is one of those weird things they call it health insurance, but yet you're guaranteed to use it. So it's not really insurance, right? It's this misnomer. Insurance is, you know, I pay insurance on my house, right? I, I don't want it to burn down, right? I mean, it's not it's not the plan. Um, you know, I hope that I pay those premiums and I never have to use it. But insurance, health insurance, is very different. You you I you know you're going to use it. Um, it's guaranteed. So it's not really insurance. You're really paying a um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what the legal terminology would be for it, but it's not, um, it's not as, as it was necessarily intended. But when you have a universal coverage, insurance does, health insurance does become insurance, right? It's there for catastrophic failure. You know, if you really get sick, you have a really serious problem or, or injury, um, then, then the private health insurance steps up and you're able to be covered. You hope that you never have to use it. Um, you know, you hope that it's unnecessary. Um, and so, so anyway, so, so the United States has developed in this, this weird, um, you know, neoliberal for-profit model. And as a result, we spend a lot of money on healthcare in the U.S., twice as much as the OECD average, um, which works out to be about 17% of GDP, um, depending on what year you pick. Um, I, you know, this year, you know, we don't really have good estimates so far, but, um, you know, and, and yet, you know, even with the expense so high, um, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies, the health, health insurers and whatnot, I mean, they're some of the most profitable businesses um, in the United States. Um, they make a lot of money at this. It's a, it's, it's a very effective for-profit um, sector. Um, and so um, obviously there are lots of incentives to keep it that way. Um, anyway, so, so there were, were initiatives early on, um, for example, um, uh, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was pushing for social security. Um, he actually, as the original bill, had uh, health care, um, universal health care, and uh, social security in it. But he was afraid for political reasons he wouldn't get it passed if he included both. So he dropped the health care piece of it 
and only pushed the social security side. Um, and so we ended up obviously getting social security and all that. So, you know, I guess theoretically, right, it, it worked. Um, but, uh, but as a result, what happened was, um, you know, since there was no, you know, universal health care, sort of, you know, costs kind of, you know, were able to, to increase slowly over time. Then eventually we had uh, Johnson creating, right, uh, President Johnson creating Medicare, Medicaid, and then all of a sudden, right, costs started to increase. Employers were using uh, private health insurance as a benefit. Um, and so they started using it. So then costs started to increase. Then we, then we get, you know, Medicare, Medicaid. And so these costs started to increase and it became basically very difficult to fund uh, healthcare um, out of pocket, right? So everyone had to have some form of insurance. Um, and so uh, private health insurance, uh, employer sponsored health insurance became the standard. Um, and so uh, now we have uh, two thirds of people uh, getting uh, private health insurance through their employers. Um, you know, we also have other, obviously, um, government sponsored. We again, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, um, Medicare is for you know the elder, uh, 65 and older. Uh, Medicaid is for people who can't afford it. Um, and uh, then we have veterans um, also benefits, and you know some other smaller groups. So, um, but a majority is driven by this uh, private healthcare system. Um, and so, I mean, again, just going back, because the, the institutional piece of it was really interesting. Um, I again, I was, I was. Didn't realize it's quite as broad as it was, but um, but anyway. So since the the pandemic started in the United States, um, the net loss of employer sponsored healthcare in the U.S. is about six point two million. Um, this comes from the Economic Policy Institute, and um, and this is a net figure. This is including people who let's say lost their job and then got another job, right, with with health insurance, or people who coming into the market or into the labor market who got jobs right away. So this subtracts those people. So even if somebody, so if somebody lost their job and then jumped into a new job, that would be a zero, okay? Um, this only includes those people who, uh, who dropped out. So, um, so that's, that's a lot. I mean, that almost doubles the number of people um, without any health insurance in the United States, um, just you know, by itself. So anyway, um, so uh, the big issue, honestly, from a cost perspective is, is the testing for COVID is free. Um, however, uh, the big expense are, is the hospitalizations. Um, you know, a, a friend, my, my, my sister's old sweet mate from college is, re is recovering. I, I hope she's recovering from COVID. She's been in an ICU unit um, since well before Thanksgiving. Um, she's, she's on a ventilator right now. They're trying to, you know, revive her. Um, but, you know, that bill will cost, you know, $500,000, a million dollars, something like that, $10,000 a day, apparently, in the ICU that she's in. So, you know, those costs could be prohibitive um, for a lot of people, uh, for most people, obviously. So, um, so none of the protections put in place um, deal with sort of those costs. And as a result, people are reluctant to, um, you know, to seek treatment early. Um, so anyway, so we have some significant healthcare inequality, just the big ones. Um, you know, half of people, uh, low income people were having difficulty paying their bills, mortgage, even basic health bills and whatnot. Um, we know that uh, Black Americans are three times more likely at 9% to have lost their health care during the pandemic compared to whites. Um, Hispanics and Blacks were, were three to four times more likely uh, to be hospitalized. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that these are essential workers, people, you know, largely working in fields that need, um, you know, the, the need to be there, right? Um, you know, we can, I don't even have to go through the list, right? We all understand who, um, you know, who's working a lot of these jobs and sort of who's, who's on the line. And as a result, there's serious uh, consequences. Um, and a lot of those jobs don't carry health insurance as well. So, you know, it's a double, uh, a double whammy, um, if you will. So um, obviously, what can we do? Um, you know, we, we elaborate more on the paper. I don't, I've only got another minute or so, so I'll just wrap it up. But clearly, um, we need to make sure that, um, you know, as, as we think about unemployment insurance going forward, you know, we need to learn the lessons of sort of what worked, what didn't work in the United States and other countries, make sure that they're, um, you know, that we're giving generous provisions and that the provisions that we're giving are going to the right places. There are going to be lots of instances where we see things like the uh, Paycheck Protection Program went to companies that didn't need it, right, um, went to a lot of people who didn't necessarily need the money and whatnot. So, so those types of uh, details need to be to be worked out. Um, but the main thing is putting uh, money in the hands of people. Um, and then the, the last thing is just, uh, you know, the United States exploring, it's the only developed country in the world without a some form of universal healthcare. 
Um, and uh, and so moving away from this neoliberal model towards something that's that's um, more accessible, more equitable um, is is sort of the the sensible approach. It's it's the biggest lesson we can learn from from the pandemic, and um, you know is that that equitable access to healthcare leads to better outcomes. Um, I think that you know most of the research to this point, except for the people really want to protect that system, um, show that to be the case. So that's uh, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. It's very interesting. It's incredible how a developed country doesn't have social security and special healthcare. Okay, well, the, our next um, the, the next paper is uh, John Watkins. It's about the policy response to COVID-19, the implementation of modern monetary theory. Go ahead. Um, you, you have to, uh, Robert. Okay, I, okay, John, go ahead. Okay, you can see it, I assume. Yes, perfect. Excellent. Um, okay, so the COVID-19 induced recession and the great financial crisis before are forcing central banks throughout the world to adopt the tools advocated by modern monetary theory, financing their efforts to stabilize their economies with keystrokes. The keystrokes create claims. And the Fed, of course, uh, can't purchase US securities directly from the treasury, but it can, however, induce the primary dealers and their clients to purchase securities with the, and work with the treasury to finance of the various facilities. So the paper will proceed as follows. The first section addresses the weakness of markets. The second uh, briefly summarizes modern monetary theory. The third section examines the institutional basis of the markets focusing on financial relations. Fourth section examines the government response and the final section concluding remarks. So COVID-19 and the weakness of markets. Markets are not alert to threats, foreign, domestic, or microbial. Even in normal times, markets are unable to provide employment, housing, or health care for everyone. Crises make matters worse. Creating the rules and policies to provide people needed goods and services falls to government. Millions face eviction. Many others confront the loss of unemployment insurance aside from the loss of jobs. Many businesses have been shuttered. The hundreds of thousands who have succumbed to no COVID-19 numbs the mind and pains the heart. Deaths preventable by a more assertive, more protective government. So the disastrous response in part stems from an over-reliance on free markets and the associated market mentality. Governors, hospitals, and healthcare workers competed to find sufficient medical supplies and personal protection equipment. Some politicians and others promoted shunning masks as an expression of individual freedom, one's God-given right to infect others. Survival becomes the survival of the richest and unfortunately the whitest. Over-reliance on markets reveals the influence of neoliberalism. The sovereign governments using fiat money can, through the power of the keystroke, direct resources where needed and foster a coordinated response. The move to fiat currency in 1971 ended the dollar's link to gold, altering the possibilities of both monetary and fiscal policy, enabling sovereign governments to better deal with crises. So in the deficit myth, Stephanie Kelton distinguishes between the descriptive side of modern monetary theory and the prescriptive side. The descriptive side describes how a modern fiat currency works. Sovereign governments issue a sovereign currency cannot go bankrupt. Sovereign governments differ from households and firms. Households and firms, of course, face a budget or income constraint. Sovereign governments are only limited by the available labor, capital, and natural resources that can be employed for productive uses. Financial constraints confronting sovereign governments then are mythical, illusory holdovers from the gold standard. And in fact, Ben Bernanke in 2009 more or less admitted as such. And this is from a 60 minute interview that you can find on YouTube, quote, we use a computer to mark up the size of the bank accounts that they have with the Fed. 
So it's much more akin, although not exactly the same, as printing money. So the prescriptive side of modern monetary theory advocates using fiscal policy to achieve full employment, rebuild the infrastructure, address climate change, and in the era of COVID-19, provide economic security to those who become economically insecure. And this rests on a number of assumptions. Briefly stated, as noted, sovereign governments issuing sovereign money lack financial constraints. Citizens are willing to hold such money given that tax liabilities are only payable in sovereign money or its equivalent, and that the private sector is unable to provide sufficient demand to achieve full employment. So MMT advocates that government provide job guarantees. During crises, guarantee the promises that we make to each other, freeze debt payments until employment can be restored while providing sufficient income to people, providing sufficient income to sustain people. <coughs> Excuse me. So the institutional basis of market economies, textbooks typically define markets as quote, places, unquote, where buyers and sellers meet. The institutional basis of the market economy lies in the promises that private property owners make to each other, formalized contractually. COVID-19 has disrupted our ability to fulfill those promises. Stopping the virus requires social distancing. For many, social distancing means no jobs, no income, and unfulfilled promises. So the vision of the economy underlying modern monetary theory recalls a view held by the institutional economists John R. Commons and Hyman Minsky, in addition to John Maynard Keynes. And they viewed the economy as a series of promises manifesting itself, among other things, in the ownership of financial assets. So John R. Commons argued that the essential quality of capitalism it's the transfer of titles and the liberation of debtors from encumbrances through the tender of lawful means of liquidating their promises. Promises that were previously personal, say under the feudal era, become liquefied. Money provides a means of release from debts. It entails the power to transfer and settle obligations. Now, modern monetary theory, of course, also involves creating new obligations, using use fiscal policy to create jobs to achieve full employment, rebuild infrastructure, mitigate climate change, pay to vaccinate the population, and so on. Commons, too, had advocated government employ the unemployed. But financing policies, as we noted, require only a keystroke. Invoking a variation of the quantity theory of money, critics argue that increases in the money supply lead to inflation. MMT responds that inflationary pressures can be dealt with by raising taxes. Financial assets are the formal manifestations of these promises. The ubiquitous liquefaction of promises comprise a monetary economy, which Keynes defines as, as one in which changing views about the future are capable of influencing the quantity of employment and not merely its direction. So the effects of changing views are illustrated by the well-known paradox of thrift. And of course, as commonly, commonly pointed out, increase, increases in saving, ceteris paribus, reduce consumption, thereby reducing income flows to businesses. But there's another aspect to the paradox of thrift and it's the effect that Keynes described the effect on wealth and re reflecting his view of financial relationships. The mere act of saving by one individual being two-sided as we have shown above forces some other individual to transfer him some article of wealth old or new. And this is also reflected in Hyman Minsky's view of the financial relations. As he pointed out, avoiding debt deflation depression points to the importance of central banks of lenders of last resort and government deficits as generators of income flows. And this points to the importance of both central banks and government deficits to provide the income to enable economic agents to fulfill their promises. So as Hyman Minsky noted in stabilizing an unstable economy, 
experience since the 1960s shows that massive government deficits and Federal Reserve lender of last resort intervention increase the robustness of the financial system. That is, in the modern economy, the job that was done by deep depression can be accomplished without the economy going through the trauma of debt deflation and deep depression. So when we look at the government's response to COVID-19, in March of 2020, the government responded to the pandemic by partly shutting down the economy. This particularly impacted the restaurant, entertainment, and travel industries. And by April of 2020, 20 million people were unemployed, 15% of the labor force ending the ability of millions to earn income. Unemployment claims increased from 1.8 million in January, reaching a height of just over 22 million claims in April, falling back to just under 8 million claims by November. And particularly affected were women and minorities who are disproportionately represented in the service sector. So when we look at the unemployment rate, and this is for 2020, going from January of 2020 to November for the United States, we see the unemployment from March to April increased from just over 4% to almost 15%, and has since been coming down somewhat. Um, when we look at the unemployment rates for, say, the overall unemployment rate, um, which is in blue, in gold here, of course, is Black or African American unemployment. The, uh, the gray is Hispanic and the Hispanic and, and African American unemployment increased particularly high. It's all been coming down, but, but to African American unemployment still remains quite high as a result of the pandemic. Interestingly, uh, female unemployment has since come down a, a fair amount since, uh, since April. And part of this might be the labor force participation rates. And I looked at, at this for both men, women, African-American, they all, the uh, labor force participation rates had come down um, and fairly significantly. So the labor force participation rate in what, in February was about 60, over 63%. By April, it had, had fallen to just over 60% and has come back somewhat. When we look at unemployment claims, we can see that again, they absolutely soared. So by May, they were well over 20 million, um, but since they have been coming down. Uh, real personal expenditures, consumption expenditures, when we look at the national income accounting, um, we see that it fell precipitously, particularly in March and then again in April, and has since been rebounding somewhat. Um, Investment expenditures isn't indicated by monthly as is consumption expenditures. The personal saving rate reveals a rather dramatic increase. Uh, so for April, the personal savings rate was about 34% and since has come down. Um, the, both the increase in the personal savings rate and the, the fact that the government provided money to individuals, to households helped uh, reduce in, uh, debt expenditures, particularly for credit card debt, which we'll look at in a moment. In terms of uh, government outlays, they soared in terms of April and June in particular to over $1 trillion. This is in thousands, so this would be a, a trillion here. Uh, the government deficit, again, in June of 2020 was of just under $900 billion. Uh, now, if we look at the data, and this again is in thousands of dollars, and this is for credit card, uh, households were able to bring credit card debt down from 941 billion to 796 billion, uh, no doubt because interest rate on credit cards are likely much higher than they would be for automobiles. Automobiles remain relatively unchanged. What is interesting is the allowance for loan and leases by the uh, deposit banks, commercial banks almost doubled from the first quarter of 2019 or last quarter of 2019 to the third quarter of 2020. Now, when we look at the Fed's response, the Fed responded by reducing the federal funds rate to near zero. It reduced the discount rate and extended the repayment period. It reenacted quantitative easing. 
It created the primary dealer credit facility to extend loans to the primary dealers. It expanded swap lines with other central banks and so on. So between March 11th and August 11th of 2020, the balance sheet of the Fed increased by 60%. The Fed's holdings of US Treasury securities increased by 114%. Federal Reserve notes increased by 10%. Reserves increased 59%. And the US Treasury general account with the Fed increased by 239%. And then the Fed instituted a number of new facilities under Section 13, Paragraph 3 of the Federal Reserve Act. And Paragraph 3 gives the Fed the power to extend liquidity in unusual and exigent circumstances to any individual partnership or corporation. In addition to the various facilities created in response to the great financial crisis, the Fed added the following the primary dealer's corporate credit facility authoring, authorizing up to 75 billion to purchase corporate bonds. First time the Fed has, that I'm aware of has, has uh, undertaken the policy of purchasing corporate debt. The secondary market corporate credit facility authorizing up to 75 billion to purchase corporate bonds and ETFs in the secondary market. The Main Street new loan facility and Main Street expanded loan facility, which the Trump administration recently ended, provided uh, support to small and medium businesses, and the municipal liquidity facility to purchase up to 500 billion of short-term debt issued by state and local governments. The Paycheck Pro Protection Program liquidity facility provided liquidity to financial institutions to extend loans to small businesses to keep employees on the payroll. And as of May 31st, the value of the PPP program was $53 billion. Uh, my own college uh, resorted to the Paycheck Protection Program liquidity facility, still laid off a number of faculty. I'm not quite sure the justification for that. <coughs> Excuse me, this is the assets of the Fed. Um, the total assets, as we noted, increased from uh, 4.3 trillion to just under $7 trillion a few months later. It's really rather extraordinary. And the different facilities are listed here as well. Um, by August, a number of these facilities, it doesn't appear to be that, that, that they had resorted to very much. And one of the interesting municipal liquidity facility, I'm unclear why it'd be interesting to investigate why the state and local governments haven't resorted to this more. Um, perhaps something with the Trump administration. The government response really reveals a trickle down approach and the Fed admittedly is circumvented by the working rules. They're restricted to providing liquidity to financial institutions and businesses. And Jerome Powell, chair of the Fed has been particularly aggressive and assertive in his concern to provide liquidity and advocate uh, for more fiscal policy. Uh, the problem of course, is the Fed cannot force, cannot induce economic agents to borrow. Uh, if the fiscal policy response has been much more muted, much less focused, outlays increased from 405 billion to over 1 trillion in, uh, in June and the deficit increased from 33 billion in January to over 864 billion in, uh, in June. Obviously the, uh, the federal government needs to do more. Uh, the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act or known as the CARES Act and uh, Scott had talked about this somewhat but they extended $1,200 per adult with income less than 99,000, 2,400 to couples with income less than 198,000, 500 per child with a maximum of 3,400 per, uh, per household. Um, and the CARES Act, as we noted, provided loans to businesses to enable them to pay employees for eight weeks. The act also required certain mortgages to provide forbearance to the households experiencing a financial hardship directly or indirectly to the COVID-19 emergency. In conclusion, there are two dimensions to the market economy that are particularly revealed by, the, by COVID-19. The institutional basis of the market economy is revealed in the promises that we make to one another in the form of financial assets. 
impaired by the inability to earn income. And the second basis is the dependence on people on employment for their livelihood. The Fed purchasing treasury securities or mortgage-backed securities or creating bank reserves to finance increases in government deficits is one manifestation of the tool of modern monetary theory. The other, the European Central Bank has also taken an aggressive role directly financing government deficits through government bond purchases. In both these cases, it's simply a matter of the keystroke. So the current pandemic is forcing governments to use the tools advocated by modern monetary theory. Governments seem unprepared, however, to embrace modern monetary theory in normal times. Kelton advocates using fiat money to achieve what she calls the people's economy, using the government's power of the keystroke to provide economic security to people. We seem to be getting there slowly, one crisis at a time. Thank you. Thank you, John. Very interesting, your paper and what a, a lot of money, a lot of trillion dollars <laughs> to recuperate. Yeah. But before, <clears throat> they didn't have money, right? They yeah. didn't have money. We have to live in austerity. Okay, our next um, <clears throat> paper is the, the Trump recession <clears throat> lays bare the weakness of the United States economy and John Carlos, please, John. Thank you very much. I'm basically going to be talking about my perception that the economy was in bad shape before the COVID crisis so that uh, we should take that into consideration and, and what we do after the crisis is over so that uh, Keynesian standard Keynesian stimulus to get back to where we were in uh, 2019 is not really uh, the right strategy. Well, Trump was uh, very, very emphatic about the uh, tremendous nature of the economy in 2019. In fact, mainstream economists uh, kept on saying as, as early or in 2016 that the economy was supposedly in good shape. But uh, actually, it wasn't in good shape, okay? So that's basically what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have a black swan event uh, at the moment, but uh, there were four black swan events in the last 20 years. So maybe we should take Nassim Taleb seriously and think about a black swan robust society. Okay, because these events are happening uh, way too uh, frequently to just uh, say that we're not going to uh, think about it seriously. And of course, there are a lot of other potential risks around the corner. Well, spending on safety is uh, not very popular because uh, we have a mental bias toward uh, immediate gratification, the present bias, and spending on intangibles such as safety is not an easy sell. So it's not going to be easy for us to develop a mentality that we have to be ready for uh, Nassim Taleb's uh, black swans, especially since public health has not received the urgency and the uh, dollars that it needs in the last uh, decade or so. Let me just turn to the stock market for a second because it was, uh, an it was news as an indication that the uh, economy was in good shape. But if you look at the price earnings ratio, it, uh, it wasn't, it was in um, an uncomfortable territory of about 30. Uh, which has not happened uh, very frequently in the past and, past and has uh, generally been um, a sign that a crisis was about uh, to occur. So there is a, a problem with the um, price earnings ratio. 
And of course, the total assets of the Federal Reserves increased uh, very rapidly, as uh, John just told us. But this is, this is a graph for uh, where we were in the last 12 years. And as you can see, it went from under a trillion dollars to well over $7 trillion now, which uh, is uh, quite uh, problematic in my view. If you look, it, it's a kind of uh, bailout capitalism is what I would call it. You call it modern mon monetary theory, fine. I call it bailout capitalism, okay? And we'll see how long uh, that'll, uh, that'll work. Uh, here is the um, two weeks uh, between March 11th and March uh, 25th, the Federal Reserve pumped uh, almost a trillion dollars into the economy. And it had an immediate effect on the stock market. Uh, well, not immediate. This is about a two-way uh, lapse uh, where the stock market began to uh, come back up. But uh, it, it is uh, quite dramatic. So there is not inflation in the goods market, but there is obviously asset inflation, as you can see uh, from here. Uh, this is a closer up view. You can see that there is about a two week uh, lag here in the kinks. Well, you can also think about a positive feedback loop feeding into the stock market, uh, namely that uh, once you have a new price, excuse me here, it changes expectations of uh, capital gains and it shifted demand curve to the right. And that then feeds on itself so that it uh, brings about further shifts of the demand curve. This is what is uh, a simple positive feedback loop. And I think it also is partly an explanation for the uh, stock market. Of course, it works also in the, in the other direction as well. Okay, well, bailout capitalism uh, stabilized the system after the financial crisis. As you can see here, this is quantitative easing one, but actually quantitative easing two and three didn't really do uh, much uh, on the real side of the economy. And as a consequence, uh, I'm rather skeptical of using quantitative easing as a kind of standard tool to increase uh, per capita output. Corporate profits, however, uh, have been doing well, as, uh, as you can see here until the COVID uh, crisis, uh, they were in excess of $1.8 trillion. And that's one of one of the, the one of the success stories of the um, economy. Savings we've already mentioned uh, the savings rate increased after the financial crisis and and just skyrocketed uh, during the uh, COVID recession. Um, however, other signs uh, that the economy was not really uh, delivering is the life expectancy. Even before COVID, it was going down, and uh, that's a rather uh, uh, negative sign. Uh, the official unemployment rate was low, supposedly as low as 3.5%, but I would make a distinction between the official rate and the real rate. Okay, the real rate takes into consideration U6, the people who are working part-time, people who were discouraged workers and so forth. So the three and a half percent is uh, quite um, misleading. In fact, the official unemployment rate has been below full employment for three years. And that's <laughs> that, there's something's wrong with that. Uh, so you got to be a little bit skeptical of that. My calculation of the real unemployment rate in 2019 brings it uh, to 7.8%, which is about twice the official rate. I calculate part-time involuntary employment, at least a third as being third, a third unemployed. 
And those who did want the job but were not looking were also unemployed as far as I'm concerned. So the total really unemployed was about 7.8%. And that's not really a very decent economy. Total government debt has been increasing since Reagan, as is well known, and hit uh, above 1% um, around uh, 2012 or so. And I, I'm not so sanguine about this because the interest rate had to be uh, has to be paid on this, and uh, uh, the question is always how long the Chinese Politburo going to continue to support our debt. Uh, I'm not so sanguine about that either. Another bad sign is the. Um, is the uh, salary wages of uh, men uh, with low skills, low education. Uh, in 2018, it was still not back to where it was in the late uh, 1970s, or actually this is in 1973. Uh, this is uh, the people with a high school uh, diploma without a college these are folks uh, without a high school diploma. Not a good sign. These are Hillary's deplorables who are giving us all sorts of difficulties in the political uh, spectrum. And um, part of the problem is that uh, the top 1% or here the top one tenth of 1% is taking a big chunk out of the economy. And uh, you can look at the wealth distribution. The top 1% has $25 million on average. Okay. The bottom 50% has practically nothing maybe a few um, household utensils, uh, maybe a refrigerator or something like that. So this guy's got $625 million. And my claim is that as long as the economy distributes income and wealth in this way, it's not going to be a flourishing economy. And uh, this is 2018, household real median income was uh, barely $2,000 above where it was at the end of the 20th century. Okay. Uh, Michigan, in many states, uh, the income was uh, still not where it was at the end of the 20th century. Uh, this is Michigan. Uh, part of the big problem was uh, the swelling of the uh, part-time workers uh, with a median income of $246 per week. Uh, it's not going to uh, deliver a good economy. So I'm arguing that the economy has had Achilles heels uh, which means that it was way out of equilibrium. It's not sustainable. It's not a black swan robust economy. There's problem with distribution. It's a problem with uh, the ideology that, uh, that dominates the economy. There's a problem with the oligarchy and the precariat, those people in the gig economy who are living uh, precarious lives. 78% of U.S. workers lived paycheck to paycheck before the crisis. So obviously this is not, uh, they're not going to be ready for a COVID recession. 40% of adults were not, would not have been able to pay $400 out of pocket uh, for an emergency expense. So, you know, we got to really think about how to restructure the economy in order to uh, make it work better for everyone, really, or mostly everyone. 
deaths of despair is a good indication that the economy was leaving a lot of people behind. Here you have 50 to 54 year olds and you can see the kink in the graph in 2000, just an indication that people commit suicide. It's, uh, it's uh, very simple as that. And you can read more uh, along these lines in my um, textbook. And that's about what I have to say for today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, John. Very interesting. Oh, especially because it wasn't a black swan. The economy was really, really bad before COVID arrives. <clears throat> well, now yeah, I will give the floor to Paolo. He has a uh, title, Theories, Policies, and COVID-19. Paolo, please. Mm. Mm. Okay, um, well, thank you for allowing me to present a few ideas which draw on the experience that uh, the COVID crisis uh, led to in, 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 in last year's spring. Uh, I will draw basically on what happened in Europe and maybe a bit more in Italy, which is my country. Uh, what we observe uh, during that period is uh, a change in attitude, uh, something that is worth focusing on, uh, which has to do, first of all, with the provisioning of uh, essential goods and services. The provisioning of these goods, well, uh, uh, had to do with the key word essential, what was essential. And uh, obviously you can assess uh, essential in different ways. Uh, the conventional way would be a trade-off between contagion and making money. That is to say, allowing business to carry out, uh, carry on with, it, with its activity. The actual trade-off that was employed was between contagion and living conditions. That is to say, uh, essential goods and services were to be provided in order to allow people to uh, stay home and keep on living decently, uh, uh, taking account that the provision of those goods did involve uh, a risk of contagion for workers. Uh, the uh, second uh, uh, attitude regards subsidies. The issue was not whether but how to provide them. Uh, all discussions about opportunism and moral hazard, that kind of uh, conventional type of discussion was banned by uh, public uh, discourse. Uh, the issue was uh, that people needed, be, people, uh, households and businesses needed uh, subsidies, grants would not do the trick and so they had to be provided. And third, um, government expenditure. The issue was not as uh, has, was for so many years whether to increase it, but how to fund it. And uh, again, the discussion was uh, about subsidies or, or grants, but it was without doubt that government expenditure had to increase. And again, conventional discussions about credit worthiness uh, didn't make any sense uh, uh, during that period. Now, this may be, uh, sound very optimistic. I will elaborate on this, but mm -hmm. obviously uh, there was uh, um, no perfection uh, going on. Um, measures taken were not necessarily effective. Uh, the uh, discussions among uh, European countries uh, were not uh, um, converging uh, on the view that governments uh, uh, could increase expenditure. And uh, well, 
John Watkins' optimism about modern, modern monetary theory was not really shared by Christine Lagarde, who uh, even at the outset of the, of the uh, crisis uh, made the blunder uh, of saying, uh, we're not here to close spreads. This is not the function of the mission or the mission of the European Central Bank. Obviously, uh, just a week after saying this, uh, the, the ECB had started providing uh, uh, a lot of money to, to markets, but that, that, that's how things are. So uh, I'm not, I wouldn't want to seem overly optimistic. What I do want to point out is that this change of attitude reflected no change in ideology, no change in economic theory, but certainly a change in mentality, a change in views about policy in the sense that uh, government was definitely not considered irrelevant or detrimental. Uh, it was considered to be the, the key institution that should manage the lockdown, the economic and social consequences of the crisis, and possibly deal with new medical care policies to make up for the disaster caused by uh, neoliberal policies. Italy is lucky to some extent, at least compared to what uh, to, uh, um, uh, to what um, Robert was saying, because it has a national health system that it guarantees assistance to anybody. Uh, in, uh, and basically you don't pay for, uh, for uh, assistance. Nonetheless, uh, by cutting expenses on, on health, uh, we had the disaster that uh, came out on, on the news throughout the world. Uh, a, a, a third aspect of, of the change in mentality concerning policy is that basically policy assessment requires a, a metric and the metric, which is usually money prices, turned out to be social needs and collective well-being, in a fuzzy way maybe, but it definitely was not, uh, uh, the metric was not money prices as such. A second aspect in the change of mentality had to do with behavior. Um, behavior, uh, the change in behavior um, had to do with, uh, oops, sorry. Oh, I got mixed up. Uh, yeah, with, with uh, change in interaction, sorry. Um, the, uh, in the sense that um, the atomized individuals that uh, neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism purports are incompatible with solidarity, and mm -hmm. solidarity was deemed important to overcome the crisis. Uh, it was generally deemed important. Uh, the um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the atomized individual is incompatible with non-price interdependence, which is what collective well-being involves. And uh, it is worth pointing out that uh, there was a, a great emphasis on solidarity to overcome the crisis. And um, it is important to stress that it, there was a difference between stressing that solidarity was required to overcome the crisis uh, is different from uh, something that will be criticized in the presentation that follows mine, which is we are all in this together. The difference lies in the, in the fact that the notion of solidarity eschews the centrality of money prices. It is not the wealthy and the powerful that were saying this. It was people in general that were stressing the importance of solidarity. And this solidarity uh, uh, occurred in terms of behavior, uh, in, uh, in the sense that people realized the importance of cooperation in avoiding contagion, in, uh, carrying, in enacting social distancing, for instance. The, uh, the heroism of medical workers. This was uh, sometimes a disguise for the drawbacks of the health system, which had been badly organized. But it is a matter of fact that medical workers in Italy, at least, 
were really heroic in dealing with the crisis. Uh, you might want to see what uh, a photograph that um, uh, appeared in all newspapers of a nurse who uh, um, collapsed on, on a table and fell asleep after a shift that had lasted, I don't remember how many hours. Uh, there's uh, voluntary groups who help people in need. And uh, I suggest you look at a, a, a nice book, which is Pandemic Solidarity. It came out uh, a couple of months ago, and it tells uh, about the uh, efforts of solidarity throughout the world. Um, and fi finally, uh, a more folkloristic aspect here in Italy was the inception of balcony music. That is to say, people uh, getting out on the balconies and, uh, and encouraging others by just playing music, by uh, trying to, again, stress the fact that we, were, we are all in it together. And so we have to, uh, uh, we have to try to make it together. Uh, the, um, obviously, this is, uh, again, uh, I wouldn't want to appear to be too optimistic. There were obviously COVID negationists. Uh, there were uh, contrasting features. But these uh, elements do suggest that we uh, focus on them for, uh, odd as it may seem, theoretical, their theoretical implications. Because basically, what this leads to is that the COVID-19 crisis showed that change is possible in terms of policy goals, in terms of people's views about the status quo and about the uh, uh, idea that there is no alternative, and, um, and, and in terms of people's behavior, in the sense that rather than uh, being atomistic and individualistic, people uh, rediscovered the importance of cooperation, just as in terms of policy goals, emphasis went to well-being rather than output. Uh, now, Given the, this, this, this fact that uh, uh, change is possible, the question we might ask is, are crises sufficient to achieve a progressive change in institutions, in beliefs, in behavior? Um, I've heard this a couple of times during the sessions uh, in this conference, and uh, I tend to be skeptical about such optimism. Um, the, the, the complexity of uh, capitalist societies and uh, intuitively uh, Polanyi's double movement suggest otherwise, suggest that crises are not sufficient. Uh, so we might ask if at least they are necessary uh, to achieve change and that they push towards change. Uh, this requires that we ask the questions, are there other ways for views, behaviors, and institutions to change. And uh, the, uh, the, my, my, my uh, idea is that uh, if we focus on governments, uh, we will not go very far away. Uh, governments are, uh, government is no demiurge. It reflects a variety of sectional interests and ideologies in society. It is a balance of powers that involves too many sections of society, not those that uh, we are concerned with when we speak about a progressive change. So uh, I'm rather skeptical in general about all uh, discussions that uh, fall back on what government should do. I, uh, not that I don't want government to act. I obviously want government to act, but just to put it in a, in a fairly uh, amiable way, I wouldn't be too optimistic about the new president. <laughs> um, what I do think we should focus on based on these possibilities of change is to seek other ways for uh, these changes to occur. And my focus is on intermediate social bodies, such as unions, social rights movements, 
civil rights movements. Uh, as I already said in another occasion, I'm surprised that in the United States, a lot of people speak about civil rights, but not that many speak about social rights. Mm. Uh, and uh, I believe that social bodies that uh, do struggle for social rights and they may generate change, uh, they can do that by uniting weaker sections of society, promoting their cooperative action, that is putting them together to struggle for action, enhancing public debate and, deliber and deliberation about progressive issues, and ultimately empowering weaker sections of society. This uh, basically leads to uh, the conclusion that change is a multi-tier process. There is more to economic policy than government. Intermediate social bodies are also important from a progressive perspective. And uh, by conceiving of intermediate social bodies as policy actors, we're more likely to appreciate that the economy is not a closed system and that economic policy is not a technocratic issue. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo, very interesting. The last words that you say about the economy. Thank you. Well, we will give the, the floor to, it's a, a paper of will COVID-19 worsen the wealth gap in the United States? And it is written by Kalpana Kana, Sophia Prodi, and Thomas Stedman. Please go ahead. Thank you, Alicia, and all the speakers before us. Um, all of the presentations were wonderful. And uh, we are picking up on one of the issues, you know, that wasn't discussed in detail, right? So it will be complement to all the presentations. So thank you for setting up the stage for us. Um, so I'm Kalpana Kanal, and I teach at Nichols College, which is at Central Massachusetts. Today, uh, we have Sophia and Tom with us. They are my students at Nichols College. And this pro uh, project started as research assistant internships that Sophia and Tom did with me last year. And Sophia looked at the historical context of wealth inequality in United States, um, specifically racial wealth gap. And Tom looked at the eviction crisis um, and the impact on blacks and minority population. Um, so yeah, so wealth gap has not happened in a vacuum. There is a historical context to it. Sophia will start by explaining the historical context. Sophia. Hi, yes, um, I'm Sophia Prouty. I'm a recent graduate of Nichols College with a degree in economics. Um, like Kalpana mentioned, I did focus on the historical context of the racial wealth gap in the United States. Um, historically, Black people have uh, been consistently pushed back more than once economically from their white counterparts. Um, so something that I did focus on in the beginning of my paper, or our paper, uh, was Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. Uh, which lasted from 1861 to 1865. Um, a lot of belief and faith was in Abraham Lincoln and that he was fighting to end slavery. Um, but in reality, he just kind of wanted to stop the growth of slavery and his main focus was more on keeping the country together, um, fighting through the union. Um, and he created the Emancipation Proclamation, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, it was a plan to set roughly about 4 million slaves free. However, it was not that easy. Um, in 1857, the Dred Scott decision stopped newly freed slaves from becoming citizens, um, which um, altered the Emancipation Proclamation plans. And then the Civil Rights Act of 1868 in the 14th Amendment did end up granting slaves who were born on U.S. soil citizenship, so that did help. But um, there was still lots of 
uh, stuff that come, including the Homestead Act in, of 1862. Um, it was supposed to give 160 acres of land to United States citizens who never fought against the country, so were part of the Union um, and didn't support what the South was doing. Uh, Black people were originally supposed to be part of this policy. However, they were left out due to poor implementation as well as discrimination. And there were some Black politicians who fight, who fought to try and get the land for Black people that they were promised but they were met with violence and then it ended up not happening for them. And then things just began to worsen and spiral during the Jim Crow era uh, from 1877 to 1965 with lynchings, white anti-black riots, the rise of the KKK and amongst many other occurrences. Um, I'm sure something that you're all familiar with is redlining. This started in 1933 with the creation of the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Uh, a part of the New Deal. Uh, this put uh, those predominantly black residential areas at a higher risk um, and made it very impossible for people in those areas to receive any types of mortgage or loans. Um, there were literally red lines drawn around those areas, which is where the term is coined from. Um, and they ended up not being able to purchase homes in certain areas. and were pretty much forced to live in lower quality housing and did not have tons of money for repairs or upkeep. Uh, the GI Bill, also known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, was created. This was specifically for World War II soldiers. Um, this was to help grant them good education, help them to receive jobs, become entrepreneurs, housing benefits. Really good bill. However, it did not assist those who were Black um, in colleges, this was a time where colleges were still open, openly discriminating against race. So there was just a lot of different instances leading up to where we are now and even to the 2008 financial crisis that already set Black people much further behind economically. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of predatory lending that was really focused on uh, Black people. Those They fell victim quite often to that. Um, and it, the crisis ultimately took half the wealth of the black population in the United States. Thank you, Sophia. So as Sophia explained, uh, the reins of historical injustices resulted not only in lost incomes, but it also had wealth implication for African-American descendants. Uh, since this is FE panel, it's important to recognize the historical works of original institutional economists. And uh, more than 75 years ago have passed since Garner Middle in American Dilemma challenged Americans to bring their racial practices into line with their ideals. But despite some of the evidences of improvements, the American Dilemma has not been resolved. Many Black Americans remain under conditions of economic disparity, and this concept of economic disparity can be compared with Veblenian notion of equality in the pursuit of the generic end of life. Um, inequality influences the health status, access to healthcare, and scope and quality of healthcare of minority and the poor. And this has been explained by the speakers before us. And as COVID-19 spreads, those in the lower echelons in society are likelier to catch the disease and die from it at a higher rate. Inequality itself may be acting as a multiplier on the spread and impact of COVID-19. Um, and the hard realities of COVID-19 pandemic are also making the disproportionate effect of wealth gap and healthcare disparity painfully clear. So, um, so now we are going to answer how COVID-19 will worsen racial inequality in the United States. And you know, unemployment data was pretty much covered by all the presenters before us, right? But still you can see here clearly that the data that's segregated by ethnic groups, right? Separated by ethnicity, you can see green is the unemployment rate. So we have data from January 19 to October 20. So we can see that the green, which represents Black or African American unemployment, is consistently higher, right? And John showed a more, more corrected versus a version of unemployment rate. 
that would be even higher, right? Uh, so the recent data I have here is October 20, and uh, during October 20, the unemployment rate um, for the whites, uh, for total average unemployment rate was 6%, but that for African Americans or the blacks was 10.8%. So this historical gap in employment also means uh, income loss for the blacks, right? And in the long run, this can have uh, significant wealth gap implications. Now let's look at uh, some data for health care disparities. I know Scott talked about it a lot in terms of health care coverage, right? Um, and then he also brought that um, Mm, yeah, he pointed data on healthcare inequality. But here, let's look at um, let's look at black workers as a share of all work versus frontline works. So the health disparity has been magnified because black workers um, tend to represent, or they are disproportionately uh, represented in the frontline jobs. So black workers as a share of all workers is 11.9%. Um, but if we look at just the frontline black workers as a share of frontline workers, it's 17%. So we can see black workers disproportionately represent the frontline jobs. And now if we specifically look at black owned businesses, so uh, this uh, graph represents overall share of all firm ownership. So if we are looking at overall share of uh, firm ownership, black owned businesses represent 9.4% of all firms and white owned businesses represent 78% um, of all firms. But if we specifically look at vulnerable industries or pretty much the frontline businesses such as food, right, uh, arts and entertainment, retail, healthcare, um, and service industry in general, right, except public administration, we can see that in these vulnerable jobs or mostly frontline jobs that are hard hit by the pandemic, black um, owned businesses disproportionately represent these businesses as well. And as some of the speakers have uh, already mentioned, right, um, some of the, uh, the black workers, right, who disproportionately represent uh, frontline jobs or essential work, right, also tend to live in historically segregated neighborhoods, as uh, Sophia explained, right, because of redlining and other uh, historical reasons. So, and they also tend to have, um, uh, they also tend to have less cushions of safety when it comes to wealth. So if they face income loss, they don't have cushions of safety. So it's likely that these black businesses will close if uh, they are losing some share of their profit. Uh, similarly, black workers are under, un uninsured or underinsured. So that means um, it's more likely that uh, they are infected more and they will likely die at higher rates. So the implication is that all of these will magnify the wealth gap that already exists. Now, Tom will explain more on how the eviction crisis will impact this wealth gap. Thank you, Kalpana. And as she said, we wanted to kind of focus on the eviction crisis as well and how it will increase the wealth gap. Um, first of all, within the last 10 years, we've seen a drastic um, decline in affordable housing units, as well as rent prices uh, constantly rising, as well as a legal system that is continuously tends to favor wealthy landlords rather than uh, tenants, which strips a lot of um, people in housing court of any protections they may have had. Uh, we also see that even though uh, 
minorities are also hit by COVID-19 the hardest, but they are also have been hit by eviction the hardest, as you can see by the data here. And due to the historical wealth gap, people of color are more likely to be renters. And within that sphere, they are also more likely to be rent burdened. So to set the stage, it is already a very volatile rent situation, especially for people of color before the pandemic. And it is hard to imagine that post pandemic or during the pandemic, it will get any easier for the pe people of color in their renting situations. And as we saw before, pay, uh, the pandemic has triggered nationwide job loss, especially for people of color and more specifically African-Americans. And I also want to um, point out that eviction is not just a renter's issue. And it's also an issue for landlords and for the overarching community. As when, when people lose their housing, it means that most landlords, and as you can see, 58% of landlords don't have an access, access to extra lines of credit or spare emergency funds, which could lead to their foreclosure. And especially since those, those buildings will most likely be in, those closing buildings will most likely be in low income neighborhoods. You will not be able to take taxes from those buildings and repurpose it into the community, leading to less funding for the community, as well as that building will uh, contribute to urban blight and not be useful for the future as well. Now, just to conclude our presentation, we would like to uh, point out some future directions, policy recommendations. And I really liked how Paolo mentioned that we should not completely rely on the government, right? So policies or changes have to also come from uh, societal level, right? So this notion of pandemic solidarity. Uh, so yeah, definitely we need to improve unionization, social right movements, civil right movements, etc. Right? Uh, given our paper, um, and many presenters discussed the COVID-19 relief package as, as a much uh, needed relief package. So uh, you know it's important. So I'm not going to go into in depth. But some of the uh, policies are really uh, the This relief package includes are necessary, but important to um, extend the policy response beyond the relief package, uh, especially when it comes to the wealth gap and minority population. And as we saw that, like as all the speakers, pretty much everyone touched on the unemployment data, right? So these, loss, these jobs that are lost during this pandemic are not going to come back. And most of the blacks or minorities um, who lost their jobs, right? Their jobs are not going to come back. So it's important maybe to have a provision, uh, a job program, right? As um, uh, John Watkins mentioned, you know, this is one of the like, uh, like MMT mm, approach tends to say that you know, for a government, for a sovereign government, there, it's not a financial issue, right? It's rather a policy decision. So uh, it is important to envision a uh, inclusive Green New Deal that can create jobs for public services, maybe in healthcare area, or those, um, you know, frontline jobs that have been lost and mostly minority population is hard hit. So maybe it's important to put a job program in place. Um, and similarly, you know, I know this co uh, COVID-19 relief package has some provision for small businesses, but still when it comes to actually receiving the PPP, payroll protection plan or some of the helps, right? Uh, the smallest of the small businesses, minority businesses tend to be excluded, right? So there has to be some specific policies um, in terms of supporting small businesses and specifically black or minority owned businesses, just to ensure that, and given these, uh, most of the black and minority businesses tend to represent the service sector, right? If they do not get some money uh, from the PPP, payroll protection plan, then they will be completely out of business. So it's important to have specific policies in place 
And in the long run, you know, this wealth gap is, uh, historical wealth gap is very significant, very high, and it gets intensified with each crisis. The 2008 uh, financial crisis, right, global uh, recession, it intensified the already existing wealth gap. Uh, and now with this pandemic, which is disproportionately affecting um, Blacks, right, it's going to magnify the already existing gap. So it's important to have a federal program of uh, reparations in place to make up for the past injustices. And economists such as Sandy Darity, Derek Hamilton have been, you know, uh, making their arguments regarding reparations. So at the end, I would like to say that it is imperative that when COVID-19 ends, policymakers equitably need to equitably address the health, economic, and social needs of those who bear the intersectional burn of structural inequality. Because history reveals that wealth gap was created, maintained, and perpetuated. So policies should try to break this vicious cycle of you know, wealth gap, which is created, maintained, and perpetuated. Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana. So it's, um, you have said many lost jobs won't come back and really it's very amazing. And we need not only for, for the research you have done of USA, but we need a job program for many, many countries. Well, um, there have been some questions, but most of them, they have already been answered. And there's one, I don't know if, um, if you would like to have some comments between you that you would like to have, we have around 20 minutes to, 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 to talk about this COVID-19. So I will give the floor. Who would like to make some comments? Could I start uh, quickly uh, about the unemployment rate? Just a quick comment. I would urge everybody to get into the mental said that when you talk about the unemployment rate, uh, add the official in front of it, the official unemployment rate, because it is so inaccurate that it, it really should not be taken seriously. So that's what I'm, I wrote a paper on it. If you're interested, uh, please send me a, uh, a note and uh, I'll, uh, I'll mail it to you. But uh, it, I think that's important, okay? Thank you, John. Definitely, John, thank you. Yes, you're right, because in Mexico, we have very low unemployment rate, but you see that most of the 50% or maybe 60% of the people that will work are in the informal, in the informal market. So that's amazing. And those are the essential workers that are dying because they can't just stay at home with a computer and work. And so this, it's a huge, problem. Thank you, John, and thank you, Kalpana. So the um, I only see here, I, did, I think it's Paolo, I think you were answering. It's a, it's a question about Rafael Schoemaker, and it's, it says, it's how far is solidarity and interaction driven by trust? If trust is relevant, is it trust in government action or in the fellow citizens? Paolo, would you like to answer? Um, uh, well, I think that what I mentioned was both trust in, in fellow citizens in the sense that there has been, uh, to some extent, an overcoming of the uh, individualist and atomized uh, attitudes that neoliberalism fosters. And the, the rediscovery of... Um, of cooperation, uh, I think, is is a breakthrough uh, after so many years of, of individualism. Uh, and uh, it may be interesting to note, for instance, that during uh, the COVID crisis, a lot of hate talk uh, concerning immigrants faded away uh, because there was a different uh, general approach to interaction. 
Um, I think there is also conf uh, greater confidence in government. Uh, first of all, because uh, people had to acknowledge that only government could deal with the crisis. Uh, second, because to some extent, at least as far as Italy is concerned, there was uh, a change um, in the sense that, for instance, consider uh, that, uh, well, in, in April, uh, Prime Minister Conte, please note, I have no specific uh, uh, interest in, in uh, uh, favoring him. Uh, he is not, uh, I'm not related to his political views, but he uh, was very tough in, in Europe in claiming that Europe's leaders were facing an appointment with history that they could not miss. And uh, the way he said it was to some extent almost threatening that there might be a collapse in the European Union if the Union did not act adequately to face the crisis. Now compare this with what happened in 2015 with the squabble between the Greek and Italian economic ministers because when Mr. Varoufakis incurred the, the wrath of his Italian counterpart, Pier Carlo Paduan, by comparing Italy's problems with its large public debt to those of Greece. There was a complete uh, different attitude in the government, which I believe increased confidence uh, in, in the government. And in fact, for quite a long time, uh, the prime minister's, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the, uh, the way he's uh, appreciated by the public was very high. So I think both things uh, matter, both uh, um, uh, trust and confidence in the government. Yes, I, I, I have a question to John Watkins. Uh, when you were talking about uh, modern monetary theory and, and the relation with uh, most of the people, especially uh, Georgieva, the president of the IMF, said that you must take care of the money you are investing and that you have to, to own the notes. I don't know, what do you think about that, John? You have to own the note? Yeah, something that you have, you, uh, that you have to take your notes. I, 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 I don't know if she's trying to say that all the money the government is uh, spending, then that has to return back to the central bank or I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And this is partly I'll respond to John Conlos on this, that Japan has a ratio of debt to GDP over 230%, and they have little to no inflation. In fact, they have a somewhat deflation. So this, this idea that um, somehow the federal debt has to be kept low is, is simply erroneous, comes out of, uh, you know, thinking that associated with the gold standard, the central banks today of sovereign governments target the short-term interest rate, what in the United States is called the federal funds rate, in other countries is called the interbank uh, interest rate. And uh, they can manipulate the reserves to target that interest rate. So interest rate on the debt really isn't an issue at all. The Fed can, or the central banks can control that. In fact, there's some speculation that- Well, that's it was simply $400 represents... billion dollars last year, John. It, it's simply- a not an issue? It's not an issue. You could simply create the money, pay it off. Yeah, but for uh, how it's long, simply, John? It's for simply a trans, it's a transfer. For how long can you do that? Uh, oh, presumably, yes. presumably the, the real constraint of the, of the government is the unemployed resources. That's the constraint, not the financial constraint. But how long can you go on doing that? Well, you know, that's an open question. If you see inflation- Well, that's a problem. It's an open question. And it Everything. can be tomorrow. Everything's it can an open tomorrow. question. You use fiscal policy, but there are real needs right now. The governments have no alternative I mean, Paulo suggested that I'm being optimistic and I don't think I am. What we're seeing is central banks and the governments of the world being dragged along 
to, to, in effect, use the power of the keystroke to create money to take care of these exigencies. They have no alternative because, because if they don't do that, the alternative is, is depression. Well, no, there is an alternative and the alternative is tax the super rich. I, even if you, well, one, the super rich aren't willing to do that. And as you well, know, well, and there is an alternative, right. but it's politically not. Uh, they're the primary not, beneficiaries of the power. They take the, the easy way out. They're John, the primary John, John, beneficiaries. Please, when, every time, just take a minute. Okay, please, John Watkins, continue. And then I will give the floor to John Kamlos, please. Well, well, with regard to Paulo, in terms of, you know, the difficulty with these other groups is that they don't have the power of the purse. They're not sovereign. And I just, and different countries, of course, have different histories. If you look at the United States, we had a full employment policy in World War II. It is pretty amazing what happened. And, um, you know, it's unclear in terms of, you know, nobody knows how the future will progress, but the government, and I think this depends on the, the, the power and the strength of democratic institutions, they have the power of, in effect, providing, making sure that uh, people have sufficient income to be able to meet their, both their financial obligations and their needs, particularly in times of crises. And over the long term, I think we're starting to see that. Okay, uh, well, I would like to do, I have another question to everybody. And it is that relation with all the money that the Fed government of USA puts in the market with, and, and how the stock market that Dow Jones falls off. Is there a relation or, it's, or, there, or there is a bubble right now in the Dow Jones and the stock market because it has increased at, at more than, 300% all the assets. So how, how do you see that? Do you think uh, it's a bubble in the financial market? Yeah, it's well, that's what I was trying to say, yes. Okay, John Colmos, would you like to say, answer? Yeah, that's what I was trying to say that uh, the stock market rose within two weeks after uh, the, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, created quantitative easing four. You know, there is a there is a very close correlation there, and in, and it makes theoretical sense because what is going to wh wh where would that money go to? You know, it go, didn't go. There was no really other place for it to go to. And as far as uh, John Watkins is uh, comparing Japan, it's an entirely different ballgame because Japan finances its own debt. We in America rely a lot on the Politburo, and uh, who knows how long that's going to go on? You know what happens if if China sells on 1.3 trillion dollars of that? Who's gonna who's gonna come up and 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 uh, pay up on that? Well, the yuan's tied to the dollar, so they they'd sink with us. Pardon? They'd sink with us. The yuan's tied to the dollar. Six no, to but one. they sell it slowly. They sell it off slowly so as to not to destabilize the market. But uh, after a while, it can become a panic and uh, we sink. Well, the Fed could easily purchase that and then they could withdraw the reserves to keep it from uh, becoming inflationary. I don't think it's an issue. Well, you make, it so, you, you, make, you make it sound like we can just go on printing money and that's that's the well, end. We don't need anything well, else. John, John, I think John, that's yeah. where I see it is. Stuck. Yeah, please. Please, please. Oh, Robert. sure. Um, is the unemployment piece of this, right? I mean, Kenneth Boulding yeah. um, used the analogy of a bathtub, right? And he said, once that bathtub starts to fill up, right? If you start pouring money, right, resources into it, um, you know, it'll eventually overflow off the sides and you got a mess, right? It drains down into your kitchen, right? Everything's dead. Um, your, your other options are sort of two pieces. One is that, that you uh, pull the plug, right? And as the water's going out of the bathtub, you fill it up, right? And accordingly. And that's where we're at right now, right? And he also said that you could, you know, go to war and you could smash a side into the bathtub and, you know, you'd have the echoes. But, um, but, <laughs> but the point is that we have a massive um, lowering of water in the bathtub right now. Right. And so what the Fed's done is gone in and dumped a bunch of water into this. It's really no different in some ways than what happened in 2009, right? In the United That's States, right. that 
you know, they went in, they poured a bunch of money and it was really more than, you know, $800 billion. I mean, if you add in the multiplier component, you know, it could be 1.5 trillion or something like that, you know, it could be, could be even above where it was before, but because there was such the lack of demand, um, I doubt if we take the bathtub analogy and we would, I mean, we can't do this, but if we compared where the economy would be today versus where it would be without the pandemic, um, my guess is that the bathtub is even lower now that we really underspent in some ways than what was, you know, needed to maintain where the level was at. So, I yeah, mean, absolutely. In, you're just, you know, you're transferring the stocks and the flows. I agree. Yeah. I, mean, I think John Comlos is assuming we're at full employment. And in that case, I would agree with you, John. Oh yeah, absolutely. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, I agree with what uh, Robert said, but John Comlos also has a point that, you know, we definitely have to use taxation as a policy, right? Because um, uh, during the pandemic, definitely as functional finance, Avalonner says, right, spending when you are in a crisis is important. But uh, later, you know, when we are close to full employment, we need to implement taxation policy, uh, like aggressively. And definitely, John, definitely, you know, taxation policy has been difficult in this country where the yes. Politburo, as you mentioned, right, has been run by the lobbyists. Right. Yes, but they've been doing that, as, as John Conlos pointed out, since, you know, since 2008, 2009 with quantitative easing. It's just all the money has gone to the, to the rentier, to the asset holders. Exactly. exactly. Which is, so which is, that's actually the problem, right? Like rescuing yeah. too big to fail institutions, risk, and, you know, right now in this pandemic, like most of the money going to Amazon or some of these uh, monopolies, right? That's the problem. That's right. We definitely right. need to tax them. That does not mean like these people at the lower echelon of the society die, right? It's the homo shosher of this pandemic, right? Of Absolutely. this biopolitics. We need to rescue them. And uh, yes. money to serve public purpose is important. And that's, I think, what modern money yes, uh, exactly. is trying to see. I think pa Paolo wants to say something, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, in, in general, I think that the general themes of modern monetary theory are uh, relevant, but uh, I, I do believe that you cannot just say, uh, well, let's use uh, uh, monetary expansion rather than taxes because there is a political problem, because otherwise you're going to be using mon money creation to finance the rich and not the poor. But they've because been doing that for 10 solved, years. If you haven't solved the political problem, you will uh, not be using money in the proper way. So there is, uh, you cannot just bypass the political issue, the political no, issue. No, but they've already been doing there. that since the financial crisis. Precisely. So, I mean, that's why I would be uh, careful not to be too cavalier about money, modern monetary theory without qualifications. Uh, well, I, they absolutely, as Kaplana mentioned, you know, they need to support working people yes, rather than simply asset I, Precisely. But, but uh, this means that you cannot just say uh, uh, we, we, cannot ta we cannot resort to taxing the rich because that's a political problem. If you, if you <laughs> think that there's a political problem there, you will have the same political problem in making money because you well, will I, be giving the money to the rich rather than to the poor, since MMT, the political balance will be in favor of the rich rather than the poor. Please let me finish and then you can continue. Uh, a, a further problem that I think should be kept in mind about uh, money creation is that it, as you just said, it goes to, it can easily go to speculation rather than to fu funding uh, proper uh, expenditure. And again, this is a political problem that cannot be bypassed just by saying, oh, uh, it, uh, you, can, you can create as much money as you want because uh, it, it is technically possible. Yes, it is technically possible, but there is a political issue that you cannot uh, bypass. Uh, and, this, and to some extent, the same sort of problems arise with foreign exchange. Uh, it is easy for the United States to say we can print as much money as we want. It is not the same thing for other countries. Uh, exactly. a, a, a footnote, when I mentioned your, uh, your optimism, it was only with respect to Christine Lagarde, who, who <laughs> did use MMT, but not quite with the approach you have. Yes. 
Yes, you, uh, Paolo, you have said be, uh, a very important thing because especially in Mexico, we just, just can't create a lot of money because then we will have an immediate crisis, hyperinflation, and we will be at least, well, I, I will invite you tomorrow, Eugenia and I uh, wrote a paper about how, uh, well, it's about Latin America and how the, the fiscal stimulus and Mexico, the president doesn't want to, to, to have more debt. So we are in an, in an austerity program. And it's a left, it's a left party, that one, that one who is governing right now in Mexico. But besides that, would you like to say something? We just have very few minutes before closing the session, and we, I would like to invite you because right now, let me see, we are having the the presidential address. It will be at six o'clock, and it will be chair, it, it will be chaired by Anne Mayhew and. The speaker is going to be Christopher Brown. And the topic is system failures in the delivery of primary goods. So uh, I think it's going to be a very, very important and stimulating conference in a few minutes. So if you want to say something, so we, well, so we will finish our, our session, who was splendid and the papers really were very, very interesting. And I hope also if you can share your PowerPoints who were very, very, uh, very good, uh, uh, well made. Would you like to say something? Uh, uh, I would like just to read, there was a, a note in a chat by Ivan Velasquez who says, taxes do not fund national programs. Taxing the rich helps with distributional matters not to fund or reduce debt burden. I agree. Yeah, um, and, and that's that's right. I mean, I mean, nobody on this panel is going to disagree with taxing the rich. We're all for that. I mean, you know, yeah. be, I mean, you know, I, I mean, none of us want to give more money to Bezos. You know, and it's really simple. I always tell students, you know, if you give poor people money, what are they going to do? They're going to spend it on Amazon. Where's it going to go? It's going to go to Jeff Bezos anyway. So then, the only way to to you know pull it out is to tax them. Um, you know, yes. is to tax them appropriately. Um, you know, you need that combination. You know, and it, I mm -hmm. and I agree with Paulo earlier. You know, pointing out the failure of the political system, and you know, we have to agree that now we have a new president in the United States. But this by you know two party system with the same Wall Street policy is not going to change anything, right? But uh, anyone who proposes something new is sidelined, as we saw, as we have been seeing in the past few past two elections, right? You know who I'm talking about. Okay, before closing, I don't know if Thomas would like to say something, and Sophia, Thomas, would you like to say something? Uh, I just, uh, just listening to all you guys speak, it was fantastic. I feel like I've learned a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, from listening to what Paolo said, I I tend to lean towards what he has said, and I mean, I feel like you guys generally agreed toward the end of it, especially. And again, just. Thank you for allowing me to be here and hear all of you guys speak. Okay, Thomas and Sophia. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. same with Thomas. I've just had a really great time listening to all of you, seeing your presentations. Um, I've learned quite a bit today. and I just want to um, express my gratitude and just say thank you for teaching me some new things and taking the time to listen to me as well. And um, I hope I did okay. <laughs> it's my first conference. So I was a little nervous, but mostly excited. So you thank guys you. did great. Thank yeah. you, Thank you well. Tom and Sophia. <laughs> okay, well, congratulations, and I have a splendid session. Thank you very much, and I'm very grateful to to moderate this this call. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Alicia. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.